news, everyone. I'm back, baby. Jake C. Lee. Angry. Everybody else sucks. Oh, huh. oh no. It's every nightmare I've ever had. Excuse me. It's time to check the link. Pretty crazy, huh? But, but it doesn't matter because none of this has anything to do with the show. You know what? You just made the list. <laughs> oh, wait, you serious? Let me laugh even harder. It's all in the ball. Sure, we talk about it all the time. Really? No. What is up, you ducks? All in football, back the second day in a row as we continue Tuesdays and Wednesdays. It's off season up till August on FTN, which make sure you go check out Jeff's work, the full guide, rankings, everything Jeff's got going on. He, he's got you covered. If you don't use Jeff and me together, I mean, honestly, that's all you need. If you don't use it together, you're just the number one accurate rank, rank one and two. We're the best out there. Can't deny it. We've been proven. But anyway, there's a lot of great talent out there. Make sure you're following Jeff and over at FTN, code all in. But this is one I usually use. But Jeff, use yours, Rat Pack, get you 20% off, and you can enjoy it over there, theathletic.com slash bets TV, first free month. Or you might get a better offer if you just click on the rankings. There's a dollar offer out there. There's 50 cents a week. There's also, So you can find stuff. Packed show, Jeff. This is going to be another team roulette of team previews as we continue our team preview shows. But we have a couple of things. We have this Scott Fishbowl 12 invite that we're giving away today. I'm going to announce that winner later in the show. And now, surprise, Scott Fish is as gracious as they come. There's going to be a second one. I am doing this right now. It's going to be at the end of the show. I'm writing down a random character from animated television that's all i'm giving you and i will take your answers at the show i will show you who i wrote down and the first person don't put them in now at the end of the show and you'll see who i wrote down and see if you win the second invite because that's uh, that's the only way i could think to do it at the spur of the moment we also have to talk baker mayfield because just because before we come on this show about 15 minutes ago jeff the trade finally yeah. happened baker mayfield has a new team it is not the Seattle Seahawks, and Seattle might be rolling with a lot of Drew Locke this year because slim chance the 49ers, as you said before we came on the show, want to send Jimmy Garoppolo within the division. He is headed to Carolina for a fifth-round pick after they traded a second, fourth, and sixth to get Sam Darnold. But Baker Mayfield is headed there. We all know the misery we've seen of Sam Darnold playing quarterback. There were talks that Matt Carroll – could be the guy after the draft or corral. Uh, I always, I don't know which way I always wanted to pronounce it the wrong way, but anyway, he wasn't going to be from all reports. Recently, the starter was going to go back to Sam Darnold, but anyway, now we don't have to worry about that. It's Baker Mayfield. Here's the, how I'm going to phrase it to you, Jeff. We know it's an improvement. Is the perception of the improvement going to outweigh the actual produced improvement? From, uh, what DJ Moore ADP standpoint? Is yes, that what, DJ Moore, Robbie. So Anderson, DJ Moore the was being under. Game. DJ Moore was being underdrafted. People were down on him, but all he's done is produce with crappy quarterbacks. So I had him ranked at wide receiver thirteen. Somebody, you know, the immediate question. I call it the Roto World effect. But anytime news <laughs> comes out, immediately we have to react. <laughs> um, are you going to move him up? No. I already have him at 13. I'm not moving up any higher. He's a front-end wide receiver, too. If he could score some touchdowns, he'd be – I mean, there'd be no question. He'd be a wide receiver one for a lot of folks out there. And it's not really on him scoring those touchdowns. He's had four in each of the last three seasons. But he's also topped 1,000 yards in each one of those seasons. He's explosive. He has the upside. There's those words that you guys love out there in Twitterverse. <laughs> But he has those characteristics, and Baker Mayfield is certainly going to be able to harness them a little bit better than Sam Darnold. Baker Mayfield is not uh, the player that we thought he was going to be after year one, but he is a capable starting quarterback in the NFL. And so there is that. I mean, there is the other piece to this as well. What does this mean for the Browns? Now, the Browns weren't able to mend fences there with Baker Mayfield, but do they have an inclination here that maybe they get somewhat of a favorable decision on the Deshaun Watson front. We have a, a couple possibilities at play. One of the big possibilities that has been kicked around is do, do they do, does Watson's side somehow win the argument that last year 
was a suspension. Was now, in suspension. order to win that argument, he's going to have to give all that money back that he made last year. Mm. But I think I could see him doing that. Uh, I don't know. I mean, obviously, I don't have the answer to that question. We'll have that answer in about a week and a half at this point. But it is fascinating. You know, as far as DJ Moore is concerned, I loved the discount we were getting. We're not going to get that discount any longer. Yeah, so I was on the discounted side. I had him as low, like 18, 19. So I was on the lower end, mostly because of what you said, the touchdown, very consistent, but the touchdown upside with Sam Darnold, I was a little bit lower. I'm probably going to pull him up to where you have him now when I make the adjustments. He'll be around 13, 14, 15. So you don't change, but I come up a little bit. But I would say this too is, even if, like, let's say we both, let's say you even improved. Let's say we even moved them up to 12 or 11. The point being when I started this question was don't let the helium similar to what the Gabriel Davis news has been all day long. Because let's it's Gabriel Davis day, as Marcus Grant said, which is every single day as I joked back, is don't let all the helium and perception that Baker Mayfield is so much better than Sam Darnold and that you want to get DJ Moore because you want him on your team. And this is finally the year for DJ Moore that what I always say, Jeff, is don't buy all the risk. Don't buy DJ Moore because you want to get him as wide receiver 10 to make sure you get him and somebody else doesn't get him from you. And all of a sudden you're paying second round price, 10th wide receiver off the board. And where's the upside of where you just drafted DJ Moore? Now, what about the fall down from there? Does this make Robbie Anderson bounce back intriguing? Does it make Terrence Marshall break out intriguing? Does it make Tommy Tremble tight end break out appealing? Is there anybody else or is this still going to be a cluster of, I don't really want anything but Christian McCaffrey and DJ Moore for you, Jeff? I mean, we have to know what Baker Mayfield is as a quarterback. And I know that a lot of quarterbacks out there don't want this moniker, but game manager would be more of the type of quarterback that he is. He's not the, you know, I I know he was prolific at the college level, but we could make an argument. The offense may have helped. The scheme may have helped that out a little bit, but he's going to be more of a game manager type. This is an offense that, will obviously run through Christian McCaffrey first and foremost. And sure, let's let's say until he gets hurt, whatever, you can say that. But even then, they have a much more capable backup running back who can carry the load in Deontay Foreman. He, he posted three games with 20-plus carries down the stretch for the Titans last year. So I think we'll see plenty of him as well. I don't think it moves the needle for Robbie Anderson. In fact, if I had Robbie Anderson in a dynasty league, all of a sudden I'm just tossing those offers out there to see if I can get rid of him. Terrace Marshall, whatever. Tommy Tremble, no thank you. Yeah, I think that's the key right there. Is That's where I was headed next. Dynasty, Robbie Anderson's price just went up. And now's the perfect time to sell. Even Terrace Marshall, depending on if somebody's enamored yeah. with the young players. And that was where you you kind of jumped in and were in the like mind. As I was going to say, what if this offense, I know it's still Matt Rule, but what if it starts to replicate the Browns? And this is not necessarily Foreman getting Hunt share, but Christian McCaffrey and the Foreman command so much each game that, you know, this is a much balanced offense where we're talking 46, 47% rushing. And then all of a sudden... It doesn't really matter just by the attempt standpoint, which as you said, Baker Mayfield, you look at his game log, not a lot of 40 attempt games. And I know that's the Browns and now it's the Panthers, but you got to understand too, is what you just said is teams understand the same thing. They know Baker Mayfield's a game manager. There's a reason they didn't let him throw the ball 40 times every single week. So I'm with you. I'm looking to sell high, but because even DJ Moore could fall into this group, if we remember last year, too, remember that start DJ Moore had? And all of a sudden, oh, my God, he's a top five wide receiver. Mike Williams and DJ Moore were the two best wide receivers in the history of football to start last year, those first five weeks. DJ Moore is even a potential si- sell high, in my opinion, in Dynasty, because people have been wanting and wanting and wanting and wanting DJ Moore to be a top 10 wide receiver. I could see that. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at his game logs right now. I mean, it wasn't as good as Mike Will- Mike Williams' start. First five games was insane last year, but it's up there. And Even it does with a tail stinker off. in week four. Yeah, yeah. It does tail off. I mean, the overall numbers are 93 catches on the season. That still stands out to me, just given the, the crappy situation they had at quarterback. Uh, I could see it. I just don't like to trade away 25-year-old wide receivers in Dynasty, but I, right. I, I could see if the price is right and you're getting enough in return. Uh, I do want to also say, just back to the backfield, this is the, the most depth that they have had in their backfield since Christian McCaffrey has been a part of this team. 
And that will lend itself to, first and foremost, keeping him off the field a little bit more, which is a, a good thing. You know, Christian McCaffrey doesn't have to play 95% of the snaps to be a top five fantasy running back. He can do that on 70% of the snaps. He's that darn good. You have Chuba Hubbard as your change of pace. You have a bit of a hammer there in Deontay Foreman. It's a nice backfield, finally. They've just they've had crap there for so long, and now it's it's pretty solid. So I think that'll help the cause out for, for anybody out there who's doubting McCaffrey as a, a top five fantasy pick. So, and to add to this too, real quick, uh, before we wrap this up, you said you don't like to trade him at, you know, being a 25 year old wide receiver. And you're absolutely right. What if you could get 26 year old and like a Deontay Johnson and a piece, a Terry McLaurin and a oh, piece, yeah. like another, you, you're looking uh, at me not as much on McLaurin uh, as okay. Johnson, but like, is the piece, what are you saying? Is it a future first or is it a, is it a throw in? <laughs> uh, I would, I would say it has to have some value. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because the throw in, okay. they're like, oh, I got a fourth round pick as well. And it's like, dude, a fourth round rookie pick is a dart. That's there. You're here's, almost guaranteed not, not to hit with that pick. So here's one for you. Would you take this? I'll throw it. Which side of this trade do you want? I'll give you an example. I give you a first and DK or DJ Moore. Well, I would take that one. Uh, Cause I don't think you're okay. downgrading too much with DK Metcalf in its current, in his current situation. Very poor perception right now though. Very poor perception. So yeah, you're buying a little low and then you get that future first and Jake, I don't know about you, but I always assume like the NFL. So the NFL, if you're trading a future first, they assume that pick to be 118, like the 18th overall pick. The myth, so yep. for dynasty, for rookie drafts, I don't care. Like people always be like, Oh, it's going to be an early first. It's going to be a late first. Do no, you know I'm just going to assume it's the one seven. <laughs> Just going to assume it's the 1-7, and if it's worse than that, oh, well. And if it's better than that, cool. That works out for me. But absolutely, I would take that. I would I would take that in a heartbeat. Yeah, so same page on that one. I completely agree. Uh, sell high in Baker Mayfield in a super flex dynasty. I'm oh, assuming somebody yeah. out there qu- quarterback needy. Yeah, <laughs> like- yeah. You're not probably not going to be higher value than the next couple days here for Baker Mayfield. That's it. He has a starting job. That's all that matters. So we have yeah. about – what 20 ish teams, 22 ish teams left to go through here. We already talked Carolina. This is the second time we talked Carolina. Let's see who we start up oh, to glares too high. Let me turn it down so you can actually see the result. Hey, look at that. Another team with a brand new quarterback that we haven't talked yet on this preview, the season preview for teams, the Denver Broncos. I'm going to start at wide receiver, Jeff, because for everybody out there that's waiting to find out who won the Scott Fishbowl invite, I asked yesterday, all you had to do was drop in the comments who your favorite sleeper wide receiver was. I was interested to find not a lot of Tim Patricks, because a lot of Tim Patricks make sense. A lot of KJ Hamlers. And, yeah, it's like, I, I love some KJ Hamler. I'm a, I'm a KJ Hamler fan, but there's, there's no path for KJ Hamler on this team without injuries, right? Because... Somebody has to draw. He has to either get past somebody or somebody has to get hurt. And then you still have the involvement of Big O and the backfield, which has two very talented. Like, is there even value with a fourth piece here? I don't think so. No. Um, if, if that's the case, if people are viewing him as a sleeper, it, it, I, I, this is the worst part about fantasy football for me. They, they will view him as a sleeper. They will draft him. He won't do anything for four weeks. And then they're going to drop him and say he sucks, which to <laughs> me is, is silly. Like, I agree with you. I, I like KJ Hamler a lot. In fact, of the of the four players, who's the most likely to get hurt, though? It probably is him of it's the four wide <laughs> uh, But I like him a lot. I mean, a speedster, you know, obviously got to see a little bit of him. Penn State games get played a lot in my area. So I got to see a little bit of him at the college level. Uh, a little bit undersized, but, you know, can be a dynamic number four. Sometimes guys are just good for football purposes and not for fantasy purposes. So I do agree there. All right. So let's go back to Tim Patrick, which is a popular one. And I don't think anybody likes him more than Ian Hardis. So let's just put that out there for everybody that doesn't know. I mentioned that yesterday. But we saw Tyler Boyd last year for the Bengals offense finish inside of the top 35 wide receivers. But 35, like barely. What was he, 34th or something? I mean, he barely checked in enough in my memory. Serves correctly. Let's see. Tyler Boyd was oh, a little bit higher, 32nd. I was off by two. But Tyler Boyd in the Bengals offense last year was 32nd behind Chase and Higgins. But 
almost irrelevant tight end value on that team and not a split backfield with that much work back there. I know it's Russell Wilson taking over, but is the fantasy world going to overvalue what Tim Patrick could be? Because we have evidence in front of, we have multiple years of evidence of the third wide receiver is just capped unless Jerry Judy just ends up being a bust, which I think is the obvious answer. But let's take that answer aside and just say, as the third wide receiver, there's a ceiling here that just doesn't seem to replicate what people perceive. Yeah, and I think Tyler Boyd is the cautionary tale. Okay, so he finished at uh, 32. How many top 20 weeks did he have? Four. That's it. That means that basically for most of the time, and outside of the top 30, by the way, he had eight of those. So you were twice, twice as likely to be frustrated by Tyler Boyd as you were to be happy with Tyler Boyd last year. And they were not consistent. They were spread throughout. He had one in week four. He then had one in week eight. He had one in week 15 and one in week 16. And that's it. Hmm. So that was only back-to-back, you know, solid performances. And that was basically because everybody was getting it down the stretch because of Joe Burrow's hot streak. So I think that's a great cautionary tale. Tim Patrick, solid player, really good for football. Is there enough meat on the bone in this offense to sustain Three top 36, let's call it wide receiver three or better, uh, wide receivers in fantasy? I, I don't think so. I really don't. Because of the tight end, because of the running backs as well, I just don't think so. So it's another case here where, yeah, there's going to be a couple weeks where, hey, maybe Timmy Patrick wins some people a million dollars on DraftKings. But for the most part, in season-long fantasy football, people are going to be frustrated by him. So Tim Patrick or somebody I talked with Chris Harris about Kadarius Tony. Who would you draft? I would go for the upside of Kadarius Tony, the higher ceiling of Kadarius Tony. Yeah, and I'm with you on that because once I get into the, actually have Tony right there with him. Uh, about f- once you get to the 40s, it's like I want somebody who could potentially finish top 20. I want yeah. that breakout that we could see happen. I don't want somebody who I know is capped, of course, unless injury, but we could say that about so many players. I don't want somebody that's capped by wide receiver 30 peak value. Again, just because that. All right, so let's go back to this backfield. Before Melvin Gordon resigned, people were saying, Javante Williams, potential top five running back. And sure, talent's there, opportunities there. Russell Wilson's now there. However, Melvin Gordon, it's it's tough to evaluate this for most people, Jeff, because we have the Broncos who sat there and for all intents and purposes told us they didn't want Melvin Gordon back. They were like, they were they were sitting out there, they just like, somebody, sign him, go ahead. And then Melvin Gordon's still sitting there and they're like, all right, well, I guess we'll bring him back. He's a really great backup and we'll give him some touches. Are we going to see Javante break out and get to 65% of the share, or do we look at a replication of last year and maybe Javante even inside the top 10 is being overvalued right now? It's not a maybe. It's definitely. And I put this uh, tweet out. I think it was last week. I don't know. All time blurs together for me. Uh, player running back. You're too high on Javante Williams running back. <laughs> you're too low on uh, Cam Akers. And I know it's cliche, but people should really be flip flopping their perceptions of these two based on the situation. I know you really want Javante Williams to happen, but Melvin Gordon is there. And the head coach, Nathaniel Hackett, has said, we are going to replicate what we did last year. Now, keep in mind, he is not talking about Denver. He was not in Denver last year. He was in Green Bay. And down the stretch, Aaron Jones would get 15 touches and A.J. Dillon would get 13, right? That's what we're going to see in this backfield. And as much as I love Javante Williams, as much as he is an explosive playmaking asset in that backfield melvin gordon is not bad at this point in his career and it makes perfect sense to use both of those guys whereas you look to the rams backfield there's nobody else there you know daryl henderson cool (laughs) he's going to be hurt tomorrow we know that kyra williams is already hurt jake funk is an athlete that's great but as far as a running back is concerned cam Akers has no competition for touches so I'm happy that Cam Akers is falling. I do not like where where Javante Williams is going for a lot of folks. I think they're overpaying. Yeah, uh, if you didn't pay attention to the percent, we've talked about this on the show because we did the Rams breakdown. And when we talked about it, it was Jeff brought it up. I echoed it. Is if you watch what the Rams did coming off an injury, people are not supposed to come back for six months in the playoffs. Everybody just goes, "Oh, he couldn't even average three yards per carry." They gave Akers bell cow work. In the playoffs, coming off an injury, he wasn't supposed to come off that fast. So, as Jeff always says on this show millions of times, 
listen to what the team tells you, pay attention to what the team tells you. The Rams told us they want Akers to be their bell cow, so I'm a complete lockstep. Before I finish off this team, also I got to take Barkley out because she keeps trying to go to the back door. That's why. That's why. If for everybody watching on the video, <laughs> I'm trying to distract her, but she's got to go potty. So as I ask you this question, I'll still be listening, Jeff. But cool. Okubu Gunumba Big O, as we try to say on the show, or I at least try to say, I'm at 21. Do I hate him? Or is he properly there because this is, again, going back to anybody after Tim Patrick. There's just not a lot here when you talk about the backfield and the three wide receivers. Or, or <laughs> let's add a different one here. Or is it that there's no difference between tight end 11 and tight end 24? I mean, seriously, if we go down through these guys, let's go. All right. Uh, 10. Uh, I'm just reading off a list of rankings here. Ready? Uh, let's even go to nine. Dawson Knox. Zach Ertz, Cole Komet, Albert O, Robert Tunyon, if he's back on the field, Mike Kosicki, David Njoku, Pat Fryermuth, Hunter Henry, Tyler Higby, Logan Thomas, if he's back on the field, Evan Ingram, Noah Fant, Irv Smith, Gerald Everett, Austin Hooper, Hayden Hurst. There's no difference between these guys. Literally no difference. The only difference between these guys is the perception that people have out there when they draft them that they think they somehow uncovered the guy who is the guy. And it's really none of the above. And I would include him in that conversation. No doubt about it. There is no difference. You are praying you found the right one. But when you have, what is that, a 1 in 15 chance, basically, good luck. So, yeah, I have him ranked higher than you. But there's literally no difference between ranking him, for as far as I'm concerned, at 13 or 21 because they're all the same dude. I, I think you listed off basically all the same tight ends I have in that range and just – Different mix because you're not wrong there. All right, as we continue team previews, the commanders. Yes, we've been waiting for this one. Hey, look, it was semi listening. We mentioned Terry McLaurin. So they, they, does that count as it was listening? Washington Commanders. Here's the first question I'll ask you, Jeff, because as soon as it happened, I wrote it up. I've been asked on a lot of shows about this situation because I keep ending up somehow talking about the NFC East because, oh, you, you like the Giants, so let's always talk NFC East. But I keep saying this, Carson Wentz, this is, so it, things can be, you can have two things and not be mutually exclusive. Carson Wentz, did he play poorly last year? Sure. Is it as bad as people think it was? No. Is he an upgrade from Tyler Haneke? Sure. Is it really that much of an upgrade? That's where I say no, Jeff, because I look at the way they played. I look at their styles. If you want metrics to back it up, all the metrics back it up, but I just go by what I watched. Wentz played better than Heineke, but I don't think it's – look what we just talked about. Baker is better than Sam Darnold. I don't think it's enough of an upgrade to say Terry McLaurin is now a wide receiver one, and Logan Thomas is definitively a top 10 if he's healthy. And now if Curtis Samuel can stay healthy, he's going to be what they hoped him to be in top three because it's an upgrade, but I don't think it's enough. So I still have Terry McLaurin as a wide receiver too. He got his new contract. Where are you on Terry McLaurin? Same range. Uh, I mean, to be fair, Carson Wentz did finish somehow as quarterback 14 last year, uh, which I don't know. Uh, it runs it was, a little bit. It was, I think it was 18th or 19th. I have to pull the number on uh, points per game, though. So, I mean, he was a mid-range quarterback, too. It was up and down. I don't think Carson Wentz – the issue with Carson Wentz and Indy was on the field necessarily – it was a lot of the other things because we're hearing all these these you know stories about Matt Ryan and how wonderful he is, and you know the the team has given some insight into some of the stuff that he was un, Carson Wentz was unable to do that Matt Ryan can do. Okay, fine and dandy, but Carson Wentz going out there is an upgrade on Taylor Heineke. Taylor Heineke even acknowledged this himself. He said, "I am the backup." It's it's pretty clear. Terry McLaurin is not the right type of wide receiver for Carson Wentz. Carson Wentz typically does better with the bigger bodied receivers, Michael Pittman, Alshon Jeffrey, that type of receiver. Uh, and he doesn't quite fit that well with these smaller, speedier receivers. And let's be clear that they haven't had time to work together so far because McLaurin was trying to get this contract sorted out. They have said that there's chemistry there with Jahan Dotson. I'm going to take a June story from the NFL and you know take it with a grain <laughs> of salt because it's a June story from the NFL. But I, I agree. Like If you're going to get one of these guys, sure, it's McLaren. He may be a tad overvalued, so maybe I don't get him at, at the right price. But you know, mid-range to back-end wide receiver, too, sure, I have no issue with it. Is there any?
anybody that intrigued you after McLaurin, like Kurt, like I said, Curtis Samuel. But again, the Dots and Samuel comparisons are out there, and it's warranted. But they're similar stylistically. You just brought up the great fit, and if you go down this roster, Alex Erickson, not exactly the greatest Wentz fit. Mm-hmm. Uh, so then you look at Diami Brown, but I mean Diami Brown is basically a deep threat. Like it. it Oh, where are you going? Is that who you're pointing at? Oh, no, I just run oh. that way, kid. Oh. <laughs> okay. That's Deami Brown. Yeah. Deami Brown. Hey, he's, kid, he's, go that he's way. He's the, play, he's the playground one. So the, I, I, is it Terry McLaurin and then just move on? Hopefully Logan Thomas stays healthy because what you just mentioned, the Wentz fit stylistically. Yeah, and I don't know about Logan Thomas staying healthy. He may not be on the field to start the season, and that could go a bunch of different ways. I mentioned with Robert Tunyon as well. If these guys aren't on the field and it's like, ah, they'll Bates? be out there at the end Sleeper of the Sleeper tight end Bates? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I, I think you'll just see a lot of the backfield. You'll see J.D. McKissick a bunch, but not enough to justify uh, rostering him as far as I'm concerned. Those types of running backs are maddeningly frustrating to, to roster the passing down backs. We should see plenty of, of Antonio Gibson, and we could see a lot of three and outs <laughs> from this team as well. <laughs> you know, if you're in punter eligible leagues, there you go. Get the punter. Um, not oh not God. over the moon about anybody though beyond I, I do like Jahan Dotson in Dynasty. Don't get me wrong there, yes. but no, nah, just McLaren in the passing game. Okay, so let's talk about that backfield and close out the commanders with this. There's been talk, all right. So look, we know Antonio Gibson, he gets to Washington and they reverse course from whatever he did in college. It, he was pass first in college, passing game first, and then he gets to the NFL and they basically run, run, run. Doesn't get a lot of passing game work. When Pickkissick was out, he got some. They even gave Jarrett Patterson some passing game work because they still had Gibson limited to essentially kind of like a Nick Chubb role. But from our own Ben Standig at The Athletic, there's already been rumors and little underling circles over there with Washington that they're not enamored with Gibson's fumbles, especially at the goal line. And then Brian Robinson could create a full-time committee. And now you're talking... Gibson gets 50%, which isn't bad. He's still the lead, but 50 versus 60 is a big deal with McKissick getting all the passing game work. Is there a world where Gibson doesn't finish as a top 20 running back and potentially busts this year? Well, I I mean, is he a bust at running back 18, 19, 20 at this point? I I don't think so. No, I I would say bust like 28. and Yeah, I would say low 20s and lower. A lot of people are missing, though. He was... Fantastic down the stretch last year. Fantastic. Yeah. From week nine on, he was the number five running back in all of fantasy. He was excellent. So I, I actually think the discount that you're getting, I hope he continues to fall. I hope he gets somehow into the, the middle rounds. I don't think it's going to happen, but I, I don't think that world exists. I think Robinson is more of a, a cuff than he is a timeshare slash committee back. So I, I'm not I'm not there. I also wanted to address Jay in the chat said, Wentz gets too much hate fantasy-wise because he's a jerk. Jay did not use the word jerk. <laughs> as they put it on I the screen. Did, as we put it on the screen. Uh, I, so here's the deal. That's not true. Carson Wentz is not a jerk. Carson Wentz is a baby. That's the issue. He's not, he's in fact a, a you know, a very pious, you know, religious dude. He's not a jerk. He is a baby. And in fact, I think a lot of the reports that you're hearing, like Ron Rivera, like, Carson Wentz is great. We love him. His bowel movements smell like cinnamon buns. Like all of this positive Mm. stuff about Carson Wentz, I think is intentionally done because Carson Wentz can't handle a Bobby Knight style coach who just yells and screams at him. That doesn't motivate him. In fact, that, that causes him to play poorly. So I think this is intentionally done. And by the way, that's not a knock on Ron Rivera because if he's doing that intentionally, Good, smart. His goal is to get the team to perform as good as possible. So I would I would definitely say no, not because he's a jerk. It's because he's a baby. That's what it is. <laughs> I mean, other people are saying, uh, you're incorrect, Jay. He actually needs to grow some down there. <laughs> like, <laughs> get, some, <laughs> get some oomph in his, uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, uh, real quick, but uh, we're going to do one more team. And then I'm going to actually give away the one I wrote down because the thing is for, I was going to put it. So the giveaway for the Scott fishbowl one from all the entries yesterday, I'm going to put into this wheel and spin it live. So everybody can see it live, which I can't do if we have the teams in here. So I'm going to save it to the end. So you got about 18 more minutes before that one. So one more team before I give away one, and then we'll do the last one at the end. And let's talk the dolphins. 
Another intriguing situation. Let's start with that backfield. Let's oh, go. What Lord. reverse? What ba- yeah. Basically, everybody's like, oh, let's talk wide receivers. No, we're going to talk about that mess of a backfield first. Right out of the gate, they bring in Chase Edmonds. That was their first signing. That's the, you know, people are saying, well, Mike McDaniel wanted to make that move. That's going to be his guy. We've seen from Chase Edmonds his entire career so far, the Arizona Cardinals did not want him to be the guy. They wanted him to be part of the equation. So we continue with the Miami Dolphins offseason. He brings in somebody who's been familiar with Mike McDaniel, and that's Raheem Mostert, who at this time last year had all the helium because if that backfield is his, imagine what Mostert's going to do with it until he got hurt. Mostert himself, as you remember, Jeff, when he was signed, said, I have to prove myself even in the offense that I should know. I'm paraphrasing. And then they also bring in other pieces like Sonny Michel. They still have Miles Gaskin. They still have all the pieces from last year, Savon Achman, everything like this. This is – is this the, the, the South version of the Patriots right now? You just stay the hell away? Well, I guess the old Patriots because the new Patriots are even better backfield-wise. I, I don't know if it's a stay the hell away or if it's hopefully a, this will sort itself out and we'll have clarity by late August, at least some kind of clarity. I, I you know, we do at least know it's going to resemble the 49ers backfield. And, and while, you know, we don't, we're not going to necessarily have the clarity of Elijah Mitchell is here. There are roles in that backfield and there is a bigger body. That's the Jeff Wilson, or maybe it's the Ty Davis price role. That seems like that's going to be Sony Michelle. So believe it or not, of any of these guys, I think Sony Michelle may be the, the <laughs> easiest to predict. And in that role, he's not the guy we want. We want the Elijah Mitchell. Now, will that be Chase Edmonds? Will it be Raheem Mostert? Will it be somebody else? I mean, I can't see it being Miles Gaskin or Saman Ahmed, but I can't rule any of this out at this point. For right now, though, best ball wise, I've just kind of stayed away from it. And like I said, I'm hoping that we're going to get clarity as we get into draft season. But we may not. And you may be right. Maybe it is just to avoid uh, at all costs. Is it a complete mess. Or Willis is awesome. Just said Patrick Laird season. So or maybe it's just the uh, he's the use chick and then he steals four touchdowns throughout the year. And that's the guy we hate all the time. Like, is, is Laird even still on the team? I don't, I, I don't think he is <laughs> but it is I'm, I'm looking it up right now because that's that was my first thought no he's not on the team anymore so, um, so, so here's your here's role. the entire in addition to the guys we've mentioned they also have Zaqu- Zaquandre White Zaquandre right who, they who drafted. you know converted linebacker you know very green super athletic but very green and then Garrett Dokes is the is the other guy in this backfield. So, so maybe White is the use check of this team and they just kind of convert he makes a team I, he seems like he's more of a practice squad guy uh, they, is there oh, a tight end you know what they could, could do? do that? That's what I was just about to say. They're going to drop like Hunter Long or uh, Adam Shaheen into that Yushchek role. They're going to yeah, drop, pull them out of tight end. I don't, think, I don't think Adam Shaheen is, is built the same as Kyle Yushchek. No, no, he's definitely not. <laughs> Hunter Long is a little too big, too, height-wise. Yeah. I'm trying to think. What, Hunter what, Long was you know, such a good pass catcher at the college level. Like I, it's one of those guys that wouldn't was. surprise me. Like six years into his career, he posts like a sixty catch season or something like that. I'm trying to see what how, what's Durham Smythe's ratio over there. What he's is, another oh, he's blocking six, six, tight end. Yeah, yeah. I was like maybe it's Ethan Carter. <laughs> or we're figuring, or we're, just, we're do just do it with Gesicki. Just do it with Why that's, not? Oh, so that's perfect. That's where I'm going next. Perfect. So. We have Gasicki last year. Didn't really break out. I mean, had another nice season, but it was a very similar season to the one before. We saw Jalen Waddle, what he did as a rookie with Tua, and they bring in Tyreek Hill. That's the biggest thing. So now you're talking Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle. The concern with Gasicki is he's been so productive from the non-tight end position, not in line. He's been playing slot or even a split out wide a little bit and then comes inside on the movement or whatever it might be. But the majority of his passing game production, which we want for fantasy, comes when he's not lined up in line. Now you bring in Tyree Kill and you pair with Jalen Waddle. I can't imagine a world, Jeff, where they're like, hey, let's put them both on the field and not have them in line unless they're running a three wide with a tight end as one of the wides. Is Gesicki potentially going to bomb this year because he's going to be asked to be too much of a typical tight end, I put in quotes. I don't know if they're going to ask that of him. I really okay. don't. 
I, I mean, you know, if you're going to compare to the 49ers and you're going to say George Kittle, that's just not a fair comparison. George Kittle is a prototype two-way tight end. Mike Kosicki right. ran 7% of his routes out, out of inline last year. <laughs> like, that's it. <laughs> so, I don't know. I, I, I'd be really hesitant there. What I can say, though, is Gesicki is a classic, this tight end sucks uh, tight end. And what I mean by that <laughs> is he's going to go out. Last year, in week one, did he did he have any fantasy points, right? Like, And people thought he I was going to be a break. I think it was a zero right? to start the year. Yeah, it was a goose egg, right? And then week two, not very good. So the immediate reaction from people in September, Mike Gesicki just isn't getting it done. And they drop him. And then, boom, no, tight end number three in week three, right? Two, two great weeks. Yeah, back-to-back -back very good weeks, then a down week, then another couple good weeks, and then kind of disappeared for a, a like while. Like nothing for the rest of the year. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. So know what you're signing up for. Yes, he has crazy upside. And somehow he, he ended up with 73 catches last year, which is crazy. He's got great upside, but he is not going to be consistent. And if you're looking for consistency out of tight end, other than maybe the elite guys, I mean, tell me when you find it, but – you're not going to get it. And, yeah, I, I think Yasiki bust, no. Madden, maddeningly frustrating, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He'll be that again this year. Okay. Then let's talk about the wide receivers. Oh, Tua, we know expectations in the NFL have been higher than what he's been able to produce so far. There's been a lot of excuses for Tua. And I would say reasons may be the better term with some excuses. There's been reasons Tua hasn't succeeded. Injuries, his wide receiving core, the team as a whole. So there's been reasons. There's also been excuses. You know, Tua hasn't lived up to his ability so far, and he might never. And it's not given that any player ever does live up to his ability. But that being said, he's definitively at least now in the best situation he's seen so far in the NFL. But it's not so much about Tua, because we know what everybody's going to say. And it's good. Tua's a fine sleeper, second quarterback, super flex. You're definitely draft. Like, okay, Tua's Tua. That's fine. The question I have for you is, can Tua support two top 15 wide receivers? Or is this more maybe like the Broncos, and they're both in the 20s, and this is a bad case scenario for Tyreek Hill? Or is it maybe like the Seahawks, where one's top 12 and one's top 20, and it's kind of more in that range? So which kind of scenario do you think is most likely? I think that's the most likely. I actually had a caller on Sirius XM yesterday on, on my Sirius XM show where he asked – Award winning question. <laughs> it was a, that show is not the PFF show was, <laughs> but oh, okay. 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 <laughs> I'll take it. Whatever. Uh, but award the deserving. Was, there you go. There, I, well, I was, I've been a finalist. So um, it was, you know, Jalen Waddle, Deontay Johnson and something else. And he, and he had said, well, Jalen Waddle is the obvious one out of those guys. And I said, well, actually he'd be the guy I tossed back. I thought that Deontay Johnson was the obvious one. I have Waddle at wide receiver 21 right now. Uh, okay. I have Tyree Kill up in the top 10. Let's see, what do I have, Matt? Eight. So the thought process being there isn't quite enough meat on the bone to sustain both of those guys as top 15. And there's a lot of recency bias looking back to Waddle's historically good rookie season. So I'm not really buying on that. Now, I will say, though, that Tua, when he had his most success, was at the college level. And sure, you could say he played with a bunch of all-stars. In Alabama, okay, you could put me with a bunch of all stars, and I'm gonna play like crap because I suck. <laughs> no, it was still pretty darn good. Where he had success was with receivers who he got the ball to in low air yard targets, low A dot targets, whatever you want to call it, and then got the ball to them in stride so then they could create after catch annually. It was a rite of passage to comp an Alabama wide receiver to Tyreek Hill. So instead of – and one of those was Jalen Waddle, by, uh, for example. Instead of getting the guys who are the knockoffs, you now have the archetype. You have the mold. You have the guy himself, Tyreek Hill. And I think this is going to be great. I, this is not a downfield threat. And I don't care. You can tell me how great his downfield passing ability is until you're blue in the face, and I'm still not going to believe it because that's not what this offense is going to be. So I think they can have success, but I think that people are too high on Jalen Waddle right now, and, and I'm uh, much more conservative with my outlook. Yeah, you're not too far off. Actually, I have Tyreek Hill at 9 and Waddle at 18, so we're, you're not, we're not even that far off. And the where Waddle is is something I keep saying on a lot of the shows is in that range anyway. It's such a big tier, basically from around 15 to 25. There's going to be such a slim difference between the production of these guys that I'm always going to wait and take. I'm never going to take the top end of the tier. All right, so first giveaway before we move to a move, new team. 
So I wrote down an animated character. Start putting your answers in the chat. I am not changing it. It's sitting right there so you know. It'll be the first one to get it right if anybody gets it right. I can let you know, Jeff, there's already one that jumped the gun in Casey, but we love Casey because he's loyal. And it's not Professor Farnsworth, though I don't, I do love the call out to Professor Farnsworth. Good news, everybody. I am giving away a Scott Fishbowl invite. Do you have a guest, by the way, Jeff? Do you have one? Droopy or Dog. Throwing in theirs? No, it is definitely not <laughs> Droopy Dog. So I will let him, I'll let you know, I'll let everybody know once the first person gets it right as we spin the wheel. And while we're spinning the wheel, I'm also going to now, after we get this, Cowboys. So, oh, we already have to stop, Jeff. Congratulations to James Wood. Launch pack, McDuck. McQuack. I have to, oh, I McQuack. wrote it wrong. I was so, yeah, I know, McQuack. That's what I was going to say. It's launch pack McQuack. I wrote McDuck. I was just so confused and like looking at everything because right there. He actually ties into both my favorite shows, DuckTales and Darkwing Duck. He's the only one to do so. He's the only, So, yes, congrats. James Wood is going to get the Scott Fish Bowl invite. The second one's coming, so stick around. I'm going to announce it right after we finish this team. We are on the Cowboys. Let's start with the backfield again. Zeke Elliott, the epitome of disappointment because everybody who said, top five running back is all the touches, blah, blah, blah. He got all the touches, Jeff. Not really. He got all the goal line important touches. He got all the touchdowns is what he got. If you watched him play, it was definitely the downside of his career. It was definitely a disappointing Ezekiel Elliott. The fantasy world wants Tony Pollard to take over that backfield. And Ezekiel Elliott has officially now been the, this is why you don't pay running backs example, case 1A. That all being said, Jeff, where do you have Ezekiel Elliott and Tony Pollard? Are we looking at a Broncos backfield now? There has been a recent trend in the fantasy industry to tell everybody how they're being they're they're too low on Ezekiel Elliott. I'm just not seeing that. Now, yes, he was <laughs> injured last year, but this is, you know, it, it's how many years of 300 touches? You know, you have 300 touches going back to 2014 or close to it. I realize not every season has been 300 touches, but we're talking a massive 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 amount of work for this this guy and credit where credit's due, he's done it. But eventually you reach that point where the efficiency declines. You lose the half step regardless of injury or not. And I think we're at that point with Ezekiel Elliott. And you're right. Tony Pollard has enabled them to close that gap a little bit. But we run into a very, very tricky situation. So if you draft Zeke, you're probably going to be expecting close to RB1 production. Pollard, you know, kind of throws a wrench into that. So then if you draft Zeke, do you cuff him with Pollard? If you do, you're drafting Pollard at a place where you're probably going to have to play Pollard. So you're playing both Zeke and Pollard in the same lineup, creating a negative correlation. Then if you draft Pollard, I mean, yeah, granted, you could catch lightning in a bottle with if Zeke goes down like you did, what, in 2020, week 15. But for the most part, his volume is going to be capped. His fantasy weekly fantasy ceiling is capped by Ezekiel Elliott. So it places both of these players into positions where I kind of don't want either of them for a multitude of reasons as it just went through. Yeah, so to answer the question in the chat, I'm trying to pull up Ezekiel Elliott's ADP. It's still 32 overall. Ooh. Overall. Name <laughs> brand recognition. <laughs> so let's talk about the running. Let's just That's overall. The running backs going around him, he is the 17th running back off the board. Uh, to give you an idea what's around him running back-wise, we're talking J.K. Dobbins, Brees Hall, Josh Jacobs, ETN, David Montgomery, and Elijah Mitchell and Damian Harris. Are there anybody? Is there, I mean, I think it's a fair question to ask. I'm sure there's one or two, but is there anybody in that group you're definitively taking Zeke over? What wide receivers are going in that range? <laughs> that's my <laughs> I question. I knew that's what you were going to say. Because I, knew that's I don't know if I want any of those guys. I mean, I want Damian Harris in the sixth round if he gets there, which I have gotten him there a couple times. Uh, but, no, nah, I, I mean, that's not a good range for running backs. We're placing a relative premium in the third round on these guys, and you either have – you know, really hope that they they break out Travis Etienne, for example. Really hope he breaks out, but you're kind of drafting him at his ceiling, or you're investing a lot of capital into a guy who 
comes with major question marks, whereas the wideouts going in that range, I, I don't think you have the same question marks with. You really don't. So just to give you that, you're, you're ready to lose your crap on this show, Jeff. <laughs> you want to know before. who the, <laughs> I, I didn't mention one running back, the running back that's right behind them. One spot. Cam Akers. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's it right there. I don't understand. I, I guess why? Well, no, I do understand why people are doing that. They think that the efficiency is the gauge, but the volume is the gauge that we really should be looking at. So, hey, yeah, Vakers is going there. That's the one where I'm kind of like, man, maybe I could go wide receiver, wide receiver, it, you know, if it works out right based on where I'm drafting and the value is okay and there's nothing like crazy on the board, and then just take Cam Akers in the third round and call it a day. Yeah, so the wide receivers around there, T. Higgins, Deontay Johnson, Jalen Waddle, yeah. you mentioned, Metcalf, and then a round and a half later, his former teammate, Amari Cooper. Amari Cooper's gone well, now. The CeeDee Lamb, deservedly way up there, potentially looking at 160-plus targets, depending on what happens, because here's the question, Jeff. It's what's going on at number two. Yes, they re-signed Michael Gallup, might not be ready for week one. They drafted Jalen Tolbert, who's a, a almost carbon copy of Michael Gallup, and then brought in James Washington. So <laughs> is the answer here, Jeff, and what's staring everybody in the face after last year, and they seem to be ignoring, is this the Kansas City Chiefs and the number two and potential top three tight end is Dalton Schultz? I guess it kind of is. I mean, James Washington is a good number four to have on this team, and he's probably going to be asked to do a lot more than that to start out. Uh, Gallup, when he's healthy, I guess could be an effective enough wide receiver four for fantasy. I don't mm. want to go much higher than that because I feel like it's going to be inconsistent. Where the consistency is going to come from is you're right. Dalton Schultz uh, has that, you know, he's a catch and fall down. He's like, you know, the new Zach Ertz or whatever you want to call him. And you can <laughs> see a lot of volume and that's great. But um, yeah, CeeDee Lamb. You know, CeeDee Lamb, if he sees 160 targets, that's crazy. And every he's worth every bit of the second round pick that he's going as right now. Yeah, he'll be pushing that top tier. All right. I saved a f little bit of a minute here. Look, over 60 entries. You have to, the, the names are so tiny and small to find out who won the Scott Fishbowl in, invite from yesterday. It was sleeper wide receivers. Like I told you, there was a lot. There was some surprises in there. A lot of Robert Woods, who we've talked about. But we haven't gotten to the Titans yet, so we'll have to save that for another day. So I'm doing this. As you can see... It's the, the wheel of fate is deciding who won this for everybody with their sleeper pick next to them. Mark Nash, KJ Osborne, congratulations huh. one to Mark Nash, who's also a loyal listener. So congratulations, Mark Nash. Before we get out of here, Jeff, KJ Osborne, sleeper, your thumbs up or thumbs down approval on that sleeper pick. Down. The number three on that team. Irv Smith, or do you not even care? Uh, big Irv, but that also means I don't care. <laughs> Irv Smith or Mike Gesicki before we get out of here? Gesicki, but they're kind of the same guy. <laughs> okay. I like that. They're on Jay the list. The <laughs> they made the list, Jake. They made the list. They the made list, the list of tight ends that are the same guy. So, yeah, that is true. Uh, the wheel of morality, turn, turn, turn. I love the reference from Jay, by the way. Make sure you're following Jeff. Rat Pack code 20% off at FTN or Corda All In, but use Rat Pack for now because it's Jeff's draft kit, essentially, for all intents and purposes. Uh, we'll be back next Tuesday and Wednesday. Congratulations, Mark and James. By the way, really appreciate all you guys dropping in the comments because it, like, helps boost the show and, you know, play the YouTube algorithm. But I just I love the fact that you guys are here every single day and every single week. Back next Tuesday, Wednesday. Again, this is the new regulars until August, back to three days a week. So we'll see you next time.